All right, so let's get started for today. And um, basically, the, the lecture plan for, day, for today is all going to be uh, topics on linear logic. It's the plan. So today's going to be linear logic today, where we've got three lectures, two in the morning, one in the afternoon. And uh, well, the first question you might ask is, why talk about linear logic? I thought this was a workshop on programming languages. Uh, so who here, so, so what, is, what does logic have anything to do with programming languages? So can anyone tell me what logic has anything to do with programming languages at all? Yeah? Propositions are types. Yeah, so there's, you, you may have heard this, these kind of slogans before, and it goes by a bunch of different names, propositions are types, proofs are programs, and also the Curry-Howard Curry -Howard correspondence. Um, and then it, it's kind of this, yeah, mysterious thing that somehow logic has something to do with programs. And so, uh, well, remember yesterday when I was talking about polymorphism in system F, and near the end there, uh, I talked about type erasure, which is if I have a program with types in it, I can erase all the types, and I still get a good program that I could run, and it does the same thing, or something like that. And so why do we do that? Because as computer scientists, what we really care about at the end of the day, the ultimate thing is what programs do, right? We're caring about behavior and what these kinds of program things, what they're doing, right? And types are just a means to an end for constraining that behavior or saying something about that behavior, describing it, controlling it in some way, but it's really all about the behavior, right? So type erasure makes sense because I don't actually care about the types per se, I care about the behavior. And that's what I want to extract from this type program, is give me just the part that's about what it does. Um, but logicians are kind of like the other way around, right? They've got these fancy proof trees and stuff, but they really care about propositions, right? They say things or statements, and they want to know whether or not they're true, right? There's propositions, something that may or may not be true, and then a theorem that actually is, and logicians care about the difference. And that's primarily their thing. And proofs are a mechanism in which we distinguish those two things. Things which might be true versus things that actually are. Uh, and so they kind of go the other way. So this, remember we've seen it a bunch of times now, and it's this kind of core that repeats itself all over the place. These were the typing rules for the lambda calculus, just the simple types, nothing more than functions. Um, and so I'm going to do something else instead of type erasure, where I had a typed program and I removed the types. I'm going to do program erasure, which is get rid of all the bits here that have to do with programming, right? So for example, here I've got this lambda, right, and the e and the x. I don't want to care about programming, just show me what things are left over, what kind of type structures are left over. So if you erase that, right, I end up with that kind of rule. Let's keep going. Right, if I erase the rule for application, I end up with this kind of rule. And if I erase the parts that have to do with variables, then I end up with that. All right, so this is program erasure, which is I had a typing derivation that a program was well typed, and then I forgot what that program was. And all I'm left with are the types. That's the idea. Uh, okay, so why is that interesting? I've got rid of the program. Well, a logician would say that's the part that I care about, right? This is the, what is this now? This is a derivation that a proposition is true, right? We don't say anything about a program. It's just the rules for implication, right? And if you look up a, a textbook on just general logic, you'll probably see maybe something like these kinds of rules, right? So this is then an axiom where the idea is if I assume tau to be true, then well, of course, tau is true. That shouldn't be a problem. And here the reading is, if all of the stuff on the left are true, then the thing on the right is true. Right? And that's what we're doing. This is a hypothetical sort of judgment in a logic 
It's where, that's why we used hypothetical. It may have seemed a little bit out of place, but it's because that comes from the logic side of things. Right? And so what's this? Well, if I know that tau implies tau prime is true, and I know that tau is true, the assumption, then it's got to be that tau prime is true. Otherwise, the implication would be wrong, or the hypothesis would be wrong. Right? And so, depending on which class you're in, this might be called something like modus ponens. If I know an implication and I know the assumption, then the conclusion must be true. Uh, and uh, you might also see this as, uh, well, we also call it introduction, but implication, or implication elimination. Right? How do I use an implication and um, extract the conclusion of it? And then the last one, Right is uh, kind of you're just rearranging your implication a little bit, right? So here it's if all of this stuff here is true, then that on the right is true. So if gamma and tau is true, if that were true, then that entails tau prime. Well, then sure, gamma on its own would entail scooting tau over. Tau implies tau prime. So this is the implication introduction. Uh, and so this is like the simply type lambda calculus when you erase the programs is a minimal basis for a kind of logic. All right. And so that's this correspondence thing, right? You can go either way in a sense, like the, the you know, typing derivations and type checking and well-typed programs is that interface between logic and programming. Right? So from this state, I could erase types and just get some untyped program, which is kind of like an assembly language. Or you could go the other way and forget about programs. Get the propositions. And so this is the, uh, you know, the, you know, people call it a bunch of things. Curry, Howard, uh, correspondence. Right, where it's proofs as programs and propositions as types. And you kind of confuse the difference between the two in a way, because the structures underlying them are replicated in both. That's why you see that. And so, um, you know, what, what's kind of the correspondence. So most of the things you'll find in programming languages mean something in logic and vice versa. Um, and sometimes it takes a while to figure out what that is, but at this point we figured out a bunch of them. So we saw that um, in terms of, uh, well, I'll say logic, uh, programming and logic, programming, uh, versus logic, All right? So what were some of the concepts that we saw about programming languages? What does that look like in logic, All right? So one of them is, so there's these, right? Propositions in logic are types in programming languages, but more specifically, functions correspond to implication, right? Logical implication. So what else? What were some of the other things that we saw in programming languages? We had products, right? So how do you pair together two things? So product, product types. What's that correspond to in logic? That's conjunction, exactly. Conjunction. Uh, so that's and. This is if, right? So what else? We had some types. Some types. What's that? Disjunction, which is or. 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 It's or. Uh, so uh, provability. So it could be that I have something like the sum of a nat and a string, and certainly there are some nats, 
and there are some strings. So just because I have a nat doesn't mean I couldn't have the other. Yeah, so, so an XOR would be something like, if I've got something from one of the two possibilities, there exists nothing in the other possibility. Yeah, so, but that's why it's just, it's just regular OR. And usually, uh, most uh, uh, logics of this style are using regular OR, not XOR. Right? It's a little bit uh, trickier to do XOR, because it's that exclusive part that you would have to bake in. Um, so some types. And uh, let's see, so in general, um, you know, numbers are then the natural numbers, right, in both. Uh, so, so uh, at a higher level, you can you can talk not just about features of a language, but kind of what's in a language. So I'll say here that the simply typed lambda calculus, so STLC, simply typed, simply typed. Lambda calc, right? And so that is these things, right? Functions, products, some similar stuff like that. What's that correspond to? So that's known in the world of logic as intuitionistic logic, right? That's the na name of that sort of thing, right? Into intuitionistic logic. Right, that the name of that language of simply type lambda calculus with whatever sorts of uh, basic kinds of types that you throw in there, that's intuitionistic logic. What else do we have? Um, uh, da, 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 we had quantifiers, right? We had polymorphism and quantifiers. So uh, I'll say uh, polymorphism. Right, what does that correspond to? This is a little bit cheating because we just use the same symbol, right? This is for all. For all, and in general, uh, second order logic. All right, so that's what if I had a logic where I can quantify over propositions? And that's, yep? What, what would be higher order, order logic? Or higher order, I think that's something we did. I don't think we got into that, but that would be uh, probably f omega, if that's something I can't remember. Yeah, but like, so usually it's the, oh, here's a logic, what is that? Is, is a really great question, right? Because you get interesting stuff. So polymorphism, we didn't get into existentials, but that's, right? So modules and abstract data types correspond to existential quantification. So that's a real cool one. Uh, so what else? We could go the other way, and people have gone the other way. So uh, there's other stuff in logic. So intuitionistic logic, I'll hopefully get into that a little bit later, right? Is a little bit different from the one you're probably used to, which is classical logic. Right, which is sort of the meaning is just Boolean logic. Everything's true or false. And you don't know that in intuitionistic logic. There can be things that are just unknown, and you don't know whether or not it's true or false. Right, that's the big difference, because in intuitionistic logic, you're required to provide evidence either way. You can't just assert, well, it must be one or the other. So that's the difference. But then what is classical logic? Classical logic. What does that missing piece, right? So in this sense, uh, classical logic says that more propositions are true than intuitionistic logic. So in it, you can think some people say, well, I start with intuitionistic logic, which are, these which are these rules, and then I just add another thing that's an axiom. And that gets me the rest of the missing pieces. Um, so what's that missing piece? Yeah? Uh, constructivism is another word for intuitionistic? Kind of. A little bit. You can, some people just say that constructivism is the same thing as intuitionistic, or it's a philosophy, and intuitionistic logic is one of those things that follow that philosophy. But there might be other logics that are constructive. Yeah, this is the first constructive logic, and it's sort of like constructivism was the thing you wanted, and intuitionism was a rejection of non constructive things. Right, but there still can be. Uh, well, and this kind of implies there's more than one logic, which is where we're going to look at linear logic, which is yet another one, which is also constructive. Uh, but so that's why it's maybe helpful to have a word that says logics with a property versus the specific one. But so what's the gap between classical logic and uh, intuitionistic logic, right? And so in some sense, it's what can I add to the simply typed lambda calculus to do whatever it is that classical logic does? And so the, the thing there is control flow, 
right? If you have a handle on control flow, you've now got classical logic. Um, and so that was first noticed by Griffin in the 90s, I believe, uh, which is that classical logic principles are control flow primitives like, you know, things similar to call CC from Scheme, which says give me my continuation or give me my call stack. Yeah, so you could get these sort of crazy things going back and forth. Uh, and there's a bunch of logic, so this is fun because there's tons and tons of logics, and you can ask what programming languages, programming languages, and programming concepts they correspond to, and so we're going to do that with linear logic. Yeah. How do you prove this? That that which that classical and control or, or, or just. Uh yeah, more or less. So so you know this is a little bit silly, but that's not too far from the truth. Right? If you say, if you capture a logic in inference rules, and if you can map each inference rule to some type of rule in a programming language, then you've got it, right? And so sometimes those things are difficult, and sometimes you might need to say the inference rules in the right way, right? So there's lots of ways of having a system that the same theorem's true, and, and you know, you can do it one way. So another one, right? So, uh, intuitionistic logic in general, so really this kind of means Gensen's natural deduction. So I'll write that here. In particular, this, more or less, is Gensen's natural deduction, which is a system for capturing what is true in intuitionistic logic. But there's other systems for doing that exact same thing. So it's, uh, there's Hilbert, uh, Bert logic where the idea is that, in, uh, uh, you know, at a high level, the only inference rule you have is this, right? He only accepted modus ponens. And then there were a bunch, a bunch of axioms that told you how connectives worked. And so in logic world, and I'll probably be using that word, word that is not a type constructor that's a connective, but they correspond to the same thing, right? Connectives join propositions together. And so instead of having like an intro rule for, uh, implication or even intro and a limb for conjunction or disjunction, there's just a bunch of axioms. And then you have to string them all together with modus ponens. So what's that correspond to? That corresponds to a whoop, combinator calculus. Which is a bit different looking than a lambda calculus because the only way of composing bigger expressions is with function application. And then I will give you a, some size of a primitive library or a library of primitive functions. And then you have to put them together to encode your function. But I'm not going to give you something like a lambda which lets you abstract. You have to encode that yourself. So saying that I've got axioms plus modus ponens is saying I've got a calculus composed made up of combinators. Right? And that's, that's something that you know the study of programming languages people do, uh, especially more in the past, not so much now. Uh, yeah? Uh, so this intuitionistic <clears throat> layer doesn't have modifiers? Uh, uh, I mean, sometimes you, you might want to just say propositional intuitionistic logic, which doesn't. And then the one with quantified. It's still like intuitionistic, but I kind of okay. being a little bit loose there. What is it's that classical with quantifiers? You can have them, yes. So again, quantifiers are kind of like a feature you can add to stuff, just like products and sums. You can have that in an intuitionistic logic right. and an a classical logic. Quantifiers are kind of like the same thing. That's features of a system. And this is more like if I've got a language or a logic with certain kinds of features, then that is or is not intuitionistic, right? Or is or is not classical is kind of the idea. Uh, but yeah, so that's. So we don't care if it's first order. Not really. Those are like modifiers on top of something else, right? So it's sort of like I've got intuitionistic logic, which might be first order or other thing. Oh, what's another one? So this was a uh, 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 second order logic. First order logic, which still has quantifiers. So I'll say uh, first order logic, logic, and that is something like, well, I want to talk about numbers, right? So I'll have a quantifiers, but I'm not quantifying over propositions. I'm quantifying over, right, there exists a number such that n is equal to n times n, right? So that's a thing you could say. So what's that kind of like? 
That's kind of like dependent types a bit. Right? If the thing you're quantifying over is programming level runtime value stuff instead of propositions, which are types. Right? So this is second order quantifying over propositions is like quantifying type abstraction. I want to do abstract data types and polymorphism. But what if I want the thing I want to quantify over is the argument to a, a function? So it's kind of like dependent types. All right, so that's kind of like the motivation on why if the only thing you care about is programming, you might want to care about uh, logic because it tells you a little bit about programming and vice versa, right? If you want to study logic, it helps to know about programming because many theorems in logic are essentially, we're going to normalize a proof, which is to say, I want to reduce a program and get the result and then something is true, right? Because I want to know something about the, um, the, the simple form of proofs without weird detours that you often do something else, right? Okay, so let's look at now the linear logic. And so what is linear logic? Uh, so can anyone tell me kind of like the gist of what linear logic is about? Does anyone know? Anyone have an idea? Yeah? Yeah, you can't reuse stuff, right? So it's kind of like a resource sensitive logic, right? That's exactly, that's exactly kind of the main point. And so, uh, you know, you, people use all sorts of analogies to say why you might want that. Uh, so you, you could say like the logic of money, right? Because intuitionistically, if I've got something, I've just got it forever and I can use it as much as I want. But in the real life, if I have a dollar, I don't have infinite dollars. That's a different thing, and it would be nice if just having one dollar meant I had as many dollars as I needed throughout my entire life, but that's just not so. And linear logic lets you tell you that to talk about that kind of thing, which is I have some things, but they're ephemeral, and once I use them, they're used up, right? There's resources, there's physical objects, and using them consumes them, right? If I have, a, I can't have my cake and eat it too, is the idea. Um, so. Let's look. So, so kind of, and the first thing you'll see when you look at a linear logic is you kind of get this explosion of stuff, which is um, up here, right, in logic, right, you just say, oh, well, I've got conjunction and disjunction and implication maybe, and so that's three things. But uh, in linear logic, the fact that you're sensitive about resources means that the idea of conjunction and disjunction is too ambiguous. You have to ask what kind. Because there's different things you could do which have different behaviors and consequences. Right? So in linear logic, you get a duplication of stuff uh, depending on how you are allocating and using your resources. So I think now, so for linear logic, for linear logic, Uh, the first thing, so let's talk about what the judgments are going to be. So here, the judgments had the form gamma entails one thing, right? So gamma is just a list of proposition, an unordered list of proposition. We're not going to care about ordering. And um, so here, ba -ba, what, what is it? So that's something like tau 1, comma tau two comma dot 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 entails tau prime. So that's the kind of thing that you're talking about with those rules. That's the basic judgment form, right? So if all of these things are true, and there should be a finite amount, so I'll also write tau n, tau n, if all of those things are true, then tau prime is true. That's the statement we're making. Um, so here, linear logic is more symmetric, at least in the original presentations and many of the presentations. Right? So this is very asymmetric, so a bunch of stuff on the left and one thing on the right. So what if I had a bunch of stuff on the right as well? So what if instead I said this, uh, tau 2 prime, dot, 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 tau m prime, 
what, did I, what, what, what if I said that? What does that look like? So the reading here is if all tau 1 dot 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 tau n are true, uh, then one of tau 1 prime dot 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 tau m prime is true. All right, so that's one reading you can give that. So this is a big function on the left and a disjunction on the right. I'm only obligated to prove one thing on the right. Yeah? Well, would it be, is it exactly disjunction? I mean, is it, you said one of, you didn't say at least one. You know, is it exactly one or at least it could, one? At least one. It could be more. Yeah, at least one. Yeah. Question? What, what are the towels in this context? Uh, propositions. Things that might be true or false. Yeah. So, you know, you, and, and, and in these, the, these kinds of uh, situations, you kind of blur the line and you're not super picky about types or propositions. So you won't get too wrong if you think of these as types. But, uh, you know, the idea here is propositions. Yeah? How did you get uh, this first uh, proposition without any assumptions? What are you assuming here? How do you get the first proposition? Meaning that... Yeah. So yeah. So how did I come up with the statement? So well, okay. So first, let's look at some of the structural rules in intuitionistic logic, the symmetric version, and then we'll essentially say, no, we're not going to want them. So that's kind of the story there. So uh, in intuitionistic logic. You've got these things called structural rules, or at least structural facts. You might not have them as rules. And that's kind of how you manipulate these uh, sequences and gather a bunch of stuff together. So uh, one of them is called weakening, which looks like this. If I've got gamma, and I'm going to do this intuitionistically first. So if I've got gamma entails tau, then gamma, I'll say tau prime, then gamma tau entails tau prime. So you might have this as a real inference rule in your system, or maybe this is just a property that if I had a proof tree that ended with this as a conclusion, I could rearrange that proof tree to get something else that ends with this. But at least for now, let's just think, does this rule make sense with the basic reading of what the turnstile means. So if knowing gamma is true is enough to prove that tau it prime is true, do I break anything by adding an extra assumption tau? Right? Not really, because I already knew, sorry, tau prime, I already knew that tau prime was true anyway, and throwing in one more fact doesn't change things. That's the idea. So the whole point here is to check that, okay, this is plausibly it makes sense. Uh, and this is called weakening because this is a weaker statement. I'm assuming more things. And that's harder than to use this as a theorem because I would need to prove more stuff to use the theorem. And it's not really needed, of course, which is the whole point. So that's weakening. Another kind of thing, and so these are admissible, maybe. If people say that a rule is admissible, it means it's not really a rule in my language, but it would be OK to add it to my language. And I know that because this is a theorem that I can always rewrite the premise into the conclusion. So these are admissible, admissible structural rules, rules. So these are structural uh, because they have to do with the structure of gamma and the structure of the turnstile. The other one is, con well, contraction, which looks like this. So what if I assume that gamma tau and also tau proves that tau prime is true? Do I really need two copies of tau? And it's just facts. If I say, like, I'm going to prove a theorem, and then I prove that same theorem again, I'm just repeating myself. It doesn't really matter what I did there. 
So I might as well just say I only needed tau, right? So this is called contraction because we've taken two copies. There couldn't ever be more than one thing on the right. I could say something like, I could say here, gamma entails uh, tau prime. The symbol for and tau is true. But does that work? If gamma shows that tau is true, do I know that it shows tau and some other tau prime, or it shows tau prime is true? Do I know that it also shows tau? Not really. Not in general. No, no, you don't. Or. You do it with or, exactly, right? Is, is disjunction right? Yes. So, like, this looks and like, this. this looks like strengthening to me. This looks like, well, no, side, so. The left side is conjunction, so you need to know more information. You need to know that so, side. it's weaker because it's harder to use it. So, if I'm going to use, if I want to extract the tau prime, I only need to provide gamma. Therefore, it's easy to use. So, I wrote a theorem, essentially, which says that, well, um, every natural number is even or odd, right? And I could then weaken that to saying that if p is equal to np, then every natural number is even or odd. And that is true. If p is equal to np, then every natural number is even or odd. But that's a really hard theorem to use. I would much prefer to have the first one. When we say weak, we, we say weaker, we mean more expensive. Uh, more expensive, or rather the first thing implies the second thing, right? So essentially that this rule works, but that this just is less informative than the thing up top. It's the same here. This is less informative than if I scrubbed out that. Right? So it's about removing information. Contraction is less about informational content and more about redundancy, right? Um, and so, so actually that's what I was going to get to here. So what if... Um, we had a bunch of stuff on the left and the right, right? So here, this doesn't have to be one thing. This could be a bunch of things. And I will habitually put the environment on the right. I will write that as delta out of habit. Same thing. Gamma and delta are both lists of propositions that are not ordered. Um, it just helps to, at least for me visually. So. Yes, it could be more than one thing, but that doesn't really matter. This is about this comma on the left, yeah? I mean, but implicit, I mean, implicitly, the comma in delta is a disjunction. Yes. And so the comma in gamma, in gamma is a conjunction. Is a yes. And the reason, one of the reasons why you want the, cam, the comma on the right to be a disjunction is to get weakening and contraction on the right. All right, so here. Uh, the other side is if uh, I know that gamma entails delta, so everything in gamma entails at least one thing in delta, is it safe to say that everything in gamma entails tau or delta? Well, sure, I already know that something in delta is true, and whether or not tau is true doesn't matter. At least one thing on the right is true, right? So this is weakening Ning on the right. And these are things on the left. And we say left or right because right, it's where we're, we're, we're manipulating that list of stuff. OK? So that's weakening on the right. And then, Unsurprisingly, there's also a contraction on the right, which is just the mirror image of contraction on the left. Uh, so this is contraction on the right. right? So if gamma is true, everything in gamma is true, then one thing over here is true. So the boring case if it's in delta, because then it doesn't matter. The interesting case is if it's one of these tau's are true. Maybe the first one is true or the second one is true. Does it make a difference? Not really. So you still got contraction. That's the reason why it doesn't matter, right? In some sense, the fact that I had two things that I could have proved that are exactly the same sort of thing, then it doesn't matter which it is, so you might as well write it once. And that's the point of, right, these details don't matter, so you may as well write them once. So this. 
Uh, well, at least with one conclusion, these are the structural rules of intuitionistic logic. You'll see weakening contraction. If you've got more than one thing on the right-hand side, this is the mirror image of those, which are also structural rules. Right? So these uh, rules were introduced in something called Gensin's because he called this thing a sequent, and this was a calculus for manipulating sequence. It tells you how to work with them. So he gave rules for connectives like and and or and implication, uh, and also these rules for managing your environment, essentially. Uh, so these are the structural rules. And especially on this side, we're perfectly happy to do this sort of thing as a functional programmer, because of course, if I've got a variable in scope, I don't have to use it, and I can use it as many times as I want. That's not a problem. And the lo linear logician says, no, I reject that. That sort of, you know, you could think like the starting point of linear logic is no to that because amount matters. That's really the essence, right? Amount matters. If things are resources that you use up, it matters how many of them I'm given. Right? If I need $2 to buy a coffee, it's not safe to say that I can use $1 to buy a coffee unless I'm robbing the coffee store or something. Right? That's a different thing. And it doesn't make sense that just because I use two copies of something to do something, that I only need one. And, and the weakening says also that right, resources are precious. We don't want to drop them on the floor and break them. If we're given something, we should actually use it. That, that's the idea. So, so resources cannot be duplicated, and they cannot be dropped. Yeah? So in programming, you don't want to say that. So what is resources? Like if I'm writing a program, I'm building on memory, so and I'm uh, having a function. So uh, can I say that memory is a resource similar? Yeah, so memory is a resource. A file handle is a resource. So when I have a memory, I can use it as many times as I want. Well, yeah, and we'll get to that. So sort of, um, we want the ability to be cautious about resources because, um, uh, so for example, maybe you've got something like a printer and you don't want multiple programs trying to print at the same time, right? So that's a resource where I have, um, I've reserved access to that. And so we've got sort of a practical language now, Rust, where there's this idea of ownership and so something might be passed around in a program, and I could use it more than once in some sense, but it's a kind of one at the time thing. And you can't just have this for free. Everyone is allowed to see anything the second it comes into scope. Right, so, so that's a little bit the difference. Um, yeah. So in parallelism, will it come to the synchronization? Probably, yeah. Yeah. So, so I will say, like, and, and in concurrent programming, there is a really big story on how linear logic had something to say about concurrency, which is referred to as session types. And there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah. Um, this is the logic we want to use for register allocation. Something like that. Yeah, exactly. Register allocation, right? Uh, and there's, there's modifications. Like, maybe I'm OK with one and not the other. So uh, uh, a really common one is uh, you say weakening is OK, but contraction is not which is I don't have a magical photocopy machine for things that just prints more than one of those. But it's OK if I don't use something I have. It's OK to be a little bit sloppy about resource use. Um, and so, so you've got things like that. And eventually, you'll see it is a little bit restrictive to say I'm never allowed to copy anything ever, because some things I could copy, right? Some things are safe to copy, and so I want a way of, of selectively saying that. Of in general, you cannot copy things, but certain things are okay to copy, and I want to say when that is. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So we've got, well, these structural rules are sensible things to have, except we don't want them, and that's what linear logic is. Okay, so now let's look at, um, well, let's look at the different kinds of rules that you can write down with linear logic. So I'll start writing down uh, some of the rules in linear logic.
Okay, so let's start with conjunction. Right? So we'll write down uh, rules of conjunction and sort of the thing to keep in mind that it matters how often something appears in my environment. Right? So how do I write down the logical rules for conjunction? So here's one of them. And in general, when we were doing a, a construct in our programming language, we talked about how do I make one of these things and how do I use one of these things. And that's that duality between intro and a limb, or here it's going to be on the left or on the right. So what does it mean to take one of these things as a hypothesis, as, as an input, if I'm given one, and then how would I produce one of these things out of the resources I happen to have? OK. <clears throat> so. One way to write down conjunction is what if I'm using tau1 and tau2 to generate some outputs delta because I'm only using tau1. Tau1 entails delta. So first of all, does that make sense? Just logically, without thinking about resources for now. If I can prove something, assuming tau1 is true, can I prove it assuming tau1 and tau2 is true? Sure, this kind of looks a lot like weakening in a sense. But in a sense, yeah. And so, so this is a form of conjunction. It's not comma. It's a connective. So, so, so usually, and and or are written like this, so tau 1 and tau 2. Uh, so this is and, and then tau 1 or tau 2. This is or. That's the idea, right? So, hmm? Yeah, but you said on the left, everything has to be true. So there's a implied and. There is. And I'm saying I'm defining a new connective, right? So. I'm defining some new thing that might be, oh, I don't know, a club. What is tau1 club tau2? And I'm giving meaning to whatever that random symbol means. And I'm kind of engineering it so that ampersand is like an and. But it's not like comma. It isn't comma, it's a connective which is one of those things we'll use to build up propositions. So, uh, well, uh, I'll do it over here. So we, and in the sense that a list of judgments is kind of like and. So I'm, I'm kind of, I haven't defined my grammar of propositions yet because it's a little bit large and scary if we just write it all down. So we're incrementally saying, how do I build up propositions? One of those ways is with an ampersand. It's like, uh, Arrow, all sorts of things, right? We have lots of constructors of propositions. This is going to be one of them. I'm going to say I've got a proposition if I've got tau1 ampersand tau2. And I'm just saying that's one of them. And there will be more cases as we go. So this is a way to build a proposition. And now I need to say what the heck does it mean if I've got one of those things? And now I'm defining what that is. And I want ampersand to mean and, because that's what ampersand means. But it doesn't mean anything yet until I've defined it. Right? So that's, that's the game we're playing. But it's where these things live. Yes. Uh, could be empty. So gamma or delta could be empty. Um, and it's a comma set. Uh, and did you get better into well, let's do some more rules. I think it, we're not going to learn everything there is. So, to clarify, were you using ampersand for and? Correct. So I'm not going to be using this one because that's so. Sure, linear logic was invented by Girard, and those are not the symbols he used. And the reason he did not use the symbols is because we're going to have more than one notion of and. So that's going to be the trick, All right? So, uh, so well, let's look at a few more symbols, see if we're making progress. Or if, not a few more symbols, a few more rules. Uh, but yeah, so that's instead of caret or v or wedge or v, he used 
ampersand and some other things. Uh, well, and also that was, that was the rule that Genson used in his paper where he put down the sequent calculus and natural deduction. So this is, uh, well, I'll call it a left rule for ampersand because it's working on the left. Right, ampersand appears on the left. Uh, we've also unsurprisingly got another one, tau 1, uh, tau 1, ampersand, tau 2. That's the other one. Percent L2. Okay. Uh, so this is just how you prove something that assumed an ampersand. How do I actually prove an ampersand proposition? So it's a conjunction. So in some sense, I need to prove both. Right? To prove A and B, I need to prove A and I also need to prove B. That's the idea. Okay. So how about... Here, I will say that if prove might be true among delta, and I prove that tau two might be true among tau true two might be true among delta, then I have proven that tau one and tau two might be true among delta. So that's the rule for ampersand on the right. Right, so unlike commas, which have very particular meanings if they're on the left or the right, an ampersand in a proposition just means I've got an ampersand proposition. Yeah? So um, to be clear, this is a single proposition. So this isn't one of the, this isn't two elements in the list. It's a single element which happens to be that. That, that is fine. I'm just trying to understand that what is our premise and what is our conclusion. So top one is premise. So saying, yeah. So there's premises from top to bottom. Okay. If all of these judgments are true, then the thing on the bottom is true. But then within that, the sequence itself has another level of entailment. So, and you see this all the time in logic, it's essentially four levels. I've got implication as a connective, so in a proposition. But then I've got an implication here in the turnstile. If the thing's on the left, then the thing on the right. Then I've got an implication as I go from top to bottom in these rules. And then there's like a meta level mathematical theorem, if then else, I prove something about the system. So those are all, all a notion of implication, and they all kind of live in different levels. So this one lives at the level of a proof tree, premise and conclusion. This one lives inside of the level of a judgment, right? And then I might have, in a proposition, another implication. Yeah. is false, then if I assume, oh, well, no, so that's, you're assuming false, right? So if you assume, so intuitively, if I assume that false is true, then anything's true, so, right? So that's why it's okay, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, the blue statement, we are concluding from the top one, right? Yeah. So we are assuming uh, the top one is true. And so, we have to, uh, so, so we're not saying that. We're saying if you can use tau 1 to prove delta, then you could use tau 1 and tau 2 to prove delta. So if all you need is tau 1, then this is more than what you needed. If I've got tau 1, then I get delta. I get the result, right? This is an assumption to the sequence, or this, uh, an assumption to this judgment. So if I only assumed tau 1, and that was enough to prove what I needed to prove, then I could assume more than tau 1. Yeah. Yeah? So here it's the same one. So this is, well, let's just say, so without worrying about resources, at least does this make logical sense? Right? So yes. Uh, but yes, yeah, so here, this same gamma is, and delta is appearing in both pre premises. Right? We copied our resources. 
And so this is called the additive conjunction because for whichever reason, additive somehow means you're copying your other resources, which are sort of side stuff of what's going on. Um, and super quickly, you can kind of uh, think in your head if that makes sense, if we're careful about it. So here, this seems a little bit dangerous because if I'm actually going to make both of them, if we think of this as a process, then how can I duplicate my resources to make them? But here, on the side that uses it, it will only ever use one or the other. So on the one hand, it's safe in that you don't duplicate things because someone who uses a, an ampersand thing will only ever need to use tau1 or tau2, but not both. And on the other hand, if we did make these different, then these rules wouldn't make sense because it says I'm not using both. Somehow I was given two things, but I only use one. So it should be the case that whoever made tau1 ampersand tau2 should um, uh, use everything they've got in either case, right, in both premises, because they'll only actually be asked to make one in reality. Um, and, and so also I'll probably call this with because that's the standard pronunciation of that symbol in linear logic, and ampersand is pronounced with. I'll write that here. If I don't mention that, I'll forget, and I'll be calling it with, and that will be confusing. Um, OK, so this is one way, the multiplicative and. Yes? So if you didn't have a weak in your would it be a logic where adding an extra assumption would negate Yes, if I add assumptions, it's no longer provable. So it's not just that I don't have weakening, it no longer is sound. Yeah. Could you have a logic weight? Huh? Could you have a logic weight? That's what linear logic is. If I prove something, if I add more resources, I can no longer prove it. OK? Um, all right. So that's one of them. And let's look at the real two fundamental rules on where that happens. So where the rubber meets the road is we change axiom. Right, so we change that rule, which is, when can I say from an assumption, I use that assumption. And here the axiom rule is tau entails tau. And what does that mean? That means if I assumed exactly that tau was true, then I get exactly that tau is true. No more and no less. So there's no room for extra stuff. Right? So if I add an extra assumption here, this is no longer provable with axiom. I've broken provability. Uh, so that's the linear axiom. Because I've, if I have it, I have it. it but um, there's no other room for other stuff. So that's, that's one of them. So that's kind of the, the, the um, gatekeeper for not having too much things. So I'm only allowed to have a leaf, at least a generic leaf, in that case. Uh, this is the additive one, but what if we want to do it the other way, right? Where if I say tau1 and tau2, I'm making two things, I make both of those things, right? In some sense, I'll need a different set of resources here because I want to, you know, think here you're a chef, I want to prepare tau1 and I'm also going on to prepare tau2, so I need the ingredients for both of those things. So those are different sets of ingredients. Let's have them be different. Here, it's what if I've used gamma 1 to make tau 1. So if I use gamma 1 delta 1 to make a tau 1, and I use uh, gamma 1, gamma 2, and delta 2 to make a tau 2, then uh, what do I have? I've got from gamma 1 and gamma 2, I have tau 1 and another form of conjunction, tau 2, gamma 1, gamma 2. All right, so logically this should make sense, right? So if I could use gamma 1 to prove tau 1, and I could use gamma 2 to prove tau 2 or delta 2, then certainly I can use the combination of gamma 1 and gamma 2 to prove both gamma 1 and gamma 2. 
because that's what I've done. So I need all of the things from both. And I'm listing them all because they're different in each case. And so this one's different than this one because um, right, we don't assume that weakening and contraction work in general. Right, so if there's a repeated thing, right, so if I need a dollar to make gamma tau 1, and I also need a dollar to make tau 2, if you ask me to make both of those things, I will need two dollars. So I need them from both. Right, so that's why you, you list out the, the, each of those in there. And so this is the multiplicative um, conjunction, which is handily a times, uh, and I'll write it when in our grammar over here, so tau 1 times tau 2, which is pronounced times, because it's the times. Um, yeah? Yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, yeah. why, why are delta 1 and delta 2 also not? Because they're also resources. So you all, it's the same kind of thing. I'm kind of using gamma because it's a little more intuitive, but it's the same sort of thing. It's just a resource on the right. Uh, which is sort of like a place where you put stuff, right? So you want to fill all the slots you've got. Yeah. Uh, yeah? It's kind of related to context. I guess. I don't know what you mean by context, so maybe. The context where gamma was to the left of turf, that was like the whole week leading up to it. Uh, maybe. I mean, so people do sometimes refer to these as context in that they are the things that are in scope. Right. So it's more like scope. And if you say context is that then sure. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So I'm kind of going to get to some examples in a little bit as we build up our library, but it's sort of the potential for both. I could potentially make both things, but I'll only really do one, make one. Times is I will make both of them right now. That, that's one way to think of it. But in, sort of sense, in some sense, in reality, I will only actually make one, but I could make either. So that, that, that is an intuition for it. Yeah. So no, because these aren't ordered, so it's in whatever order is convenient. So, so in one sense, uh, you can always disentangle it, right? So that's fine. On the other sense, figuring out how to disentangle it might be hard, but that's okay. And so from reading top down, that's fine. From reading bottom up, it may be difficult to split. And in general, that is a really difficult operation. So this isn't that, well, it, this isn't, an inference rule does not apply that something is easy, just that it makes sense. And so we are defining it to be a valid case. Uh, okay, so, so that's the maker, makes actually both for real, rather than just I could make hypothetically. Uh, so what happens when you go to use it? So remember, we don't want to drop any resources. So if, all right, so here, tau 2, delta, so this is the uh, right rule for times. So uh, what about the left rule? So when do I use the times of tau 1 and tau 2? So when do I use both of them? Well, we've got a way of saying that already, which is the comma to the left is an and, and this is an and. So this one says, uh, that I have both, right? So if, if I need tau 1 and tau 2, that's the same thing as saying I need tau 1 times tau 2, because that means I'll actually be provided both of them. So uh, in linear logic, right, because you've got more than one notion of and, it becomes interesting to ask, well, yes, the comma on the left is a sort of conjunction, but which conjunction is it? So really, the comma on the left is a times, or vice versa, times is when you want to put the comma on the left into a proposition, right? They code, sort of go back and forth. So in the one way, times dissolves into a comma. On the other way, the comma is internalized in propositions as times. On the left, of course, the, the conjunctive comma. 
Okay. Um, so that is conjunction part. Let's look at the disjunction part. And so here's kind of where you see this duplication happening because um, when you're sensitive about how much you use something, these two different definitions of what a conjunction means are just not the same thing. They're not compatible with another, one another. Or rather, it's not that I can just use a with to prove a times or vice versa. Right? They're not an interchangeable concept. Right? It's the difference of potential versus actual conjunction. So this is potential for something, and that's an actual combination. Uh, and the same story repeats itself uh, when you're doing disjunction. So, uh, so let's start with uh, what will be the more familiar one to us, because it corresponds very neatly to a sum type in programming languages. Uh, so there, right? what are the rules for a sum type? So the easy ones are the introductions. If I've got one of the things and I have I could have. Right? So if I have, if I have a tau, uh, and a gamma, then certainly I've got a tau, sorry, tau 1. And I've got tau 1 plus tau 2. Uh, right, so this is like the intro rule for a sum type, except that there's that extra delta there because we're being symmetric. But aside from that, it's the exact same thing, right? In the sum type, if I had one of the two possibilities, then I have possibly one of the two things, right? So that's what that is. Uh, and then I've got the other one, of course. Gamma entails that tau 2 uh, or delta. If that's true, then gamma entails tau 1 plus tau 2 or delta. So this is the other rule just the other possibility, right? And so this is kind of disjunction, because if I know under the assumptions that tau 1 is true, then I know tau 1 or tau 2 is true. Right? That's the kind of just logical reading. What's the matching left rule? So if this is how things are made, how are they? And so here we've got... Um, in order to use a tau 1 plus tau 2 plus left, right? if someone says, I'm going to give you tau 1 or tau 2, what do you have to do? You have to be prepared to handle either possibility. Right? That, that's the idea. And for plus, only one of those possibilities will be taken. Right? They're going to say, OK, I picked tau 1, or OK, I picked tau 2. So what do you need to do as a responder to do that? Well, I need to be able to use up tau 1, and I need to be able to use up tau 2. And the question is, what resources do I use in order to do that? Right? And remember, we saw the difference between the additive versus the multiplicative when I have more than one premise. So should I? divvy up my resources in the two cases, or should I just use everything I've got in either case? Any ideas? Which of the two we should do? Uh, everything, I think I heard? Yeah. It's everything, because the person making it's only ever going to actually give me one of these. Right? And if I'm only ever actually going to receive one of these, that means I have to use everything in either case. Right? And so that's why this is additive disjunction. And it kind of matches the intro rule. So there's, there's always a, a um, coordination between the, the two sides of a connective. And here you also have to think about resource. Right? Is someone given the possibility or a choice versus is it really an actual combination of two things? And so here it's a 
choice, so we have to do everything in either case. Yeah? So you say that you know, these top rules are how we make these, and some yes. of these other rules are how we use them, but they all kind of look like introduction rules to me, in that they all have. They are. So they are intros, but the question is, are they intros on the left or on the right? So using something on the right, which is how we've been saying that in the lambda calculus, is like saying, I build a use case on the left. Right? Yeah, and so I, uh, I'll get to that a little bit more um, after lunch. But the, so we won't. They're all going to be intros on the left or the right. And that's because this is modeled after I wrote that, the sequent calculus, right? So there's two different ways of doing things. With intro and a limb, that's called natural deduction. Or with left and right, and that's called the sequent calculus. So linear logic was modeled in this way. This is the uh, symmetric way of doing it because it was built on a lot of symmetry. That was one of the many motivations for developing this thing. So it was d developed in this symmetric way. Uh, but you, whenever you see something on the left, you can think of it as a sort of a limb. Just, I haven't said what I'm eliming on yet. It's a hypothetical elimination. Yeah. So this one, just to complete it, looks like this. Uh, tau 2 entails delta. So just to complete what I said. And it's, I think, a good time to go talk about what an actual elim looks like in this calculus. So these left rules don't eliminate something. They just sort of say, if I were provided one of these things, how would I somehow use that sort of thing? Right? Like here, if I were provided one of these two possibilities, well, in the first case, I would do that. In the second case, I would do that. I don't say what is going to be one of those two possibilities. Right? And so the connecting of the production or the maker and the user, right, the producer and the consumer, is called the cut rule. Cut. And what does cut say? Is if someone makes a thing and someone wants a thing, then they can get together and exchange, right? It's sort of, you know, the rule of commerce. And here, I'll say if I've got gamma entails tau or delta, so I've got a maker of taus. Gamma prime, delta prime. I've got a user of taus. Then they get together and exchange the tau, and I don't actually see it anymore below the line. Because, intuitively, if it's the case that tau one, or tau was the thing that was true, I can always plug it in over here, like the substitution lemma, and then I don't have tau anymore, right? Uh, otherwise, if it's delta, then it does. Then tau was irrelevant anyway, and let's just forget about it, right? So that's why it's called cut, because we're getting rid of tau entirely from my proof. Okay, so here that's gamma gamma prime, delta delta prime. So you need uh, everything else because, right, they're kind of the side conditions, and we should be careful not to drop them. So this is why I don't have weakening, because there's no extra stuff. And this is why I don't have contraction, because they're not merged, right? They're, se they're kept separate. Um, but yeah, so sort of um, an M rule is a combination of a left rule and cut, right? So it's the, if I had a plus, and I had a left rule that wanted a plus, I get exactly the elim rule for plus. That's the idea. And let's keep track of where, what we're doing. Tau 1 plus tau 2 plus, right? So that was the next connective we were defining. So that's kind of the idea. So this is the really fundamental, uh, the, the, the basic rules of linear logic. They don't say anything about a proposition in general, just how things go together. And then these are the, well, let's look at the proposition really and say what it's about. All right, so those are the well, cut and identity rules. Oh, this might also be called identity. I'll say that as well. Identity slash ax for axiom. Uh, I'm pretty sure most people refer to that as identity because it's the identity function. 
I'm given a tau, I am a maker for taus because I just exchange where it goes. I'm a middleman that does nothing interesting. Um, okay. But so now that was this was the uh, additive conjunction. So what about, or sorry, disjunction, what about the other way, right? Where there was an additive and multiplicative conjunction, which is to say whether or not it's potential or actual, or whether or not the environments are split or shared, right? So what about for disjunction? Uh, and so let's look at what uh, that'll be like. So remember the difference is you looked at this rule that had more than one premise and you set, ask yourself what happens if there are different resources for both premises that are then combined, right? So we've got what if I had something like this, uh, delta 1, gamma 1, tau, so gamma 2, tau 2 entails delta 2, and then I have uh, gamma 1, uh, delta 1, sorry, gamma 1, gamma 2, uh, tau 1, Funny symbol tau 2, delta 1, delta 2. Um, so that's the traditional symbol for the multiplicative disjunction. And this is the right rule. Um, so let's write that down in our grammar. Tau 1, tau 2. And the typical pronunciation is par, and this is going to be terribly confusing because we talked about par parallelism yesterday. So this is a different thing. So don't just think par means, oh, what I do is I execute thing, two things in parallel. It's a bit different than that. But that was the reading that was originally assigned. And I don't know what other word to call that other than it. But that's when people talk about par or they have multiplicative disjunction. That's sort of the, the traditional terminology for that sort of thing. Okay. And now, so this is how I use one of these things, which is somehow not, I'm given something that might be one of two possibilities, but I'm given something that is both of those two different possibilities. Right? It's a little bit of a different sort of thing. The intuition might break down a little bit, uh, but the key is, well, this looks an awful lot like that, except it appears on the other side of the turnstile, is really the only difference. So might we take a guess on what the intro rule is? So when is it the case that, well, I won't write the resources yet, but when is it the case that I could make one of these tau one par tau two things? Whoops, wrong direction on the right. Might we take a guess? So what is tau? Or sorry, what is, yeah, what is the, the? It just kind of splits up and dissolves into a comma. So what if we just do that? Right, so what if this was just tau 1 comma tau 2 on the right? And okay, maybe I've got some other stuff as well, but that doesn't really matter for this. And that is the right rule for par. Sort of, I did this just by looking at one of the things I already had, recognizing I was doing the mirror image of something and continuing that thought. And so here, remember, I said that because we've got two different conjunctions, you should ask yourself, when I say that I've got a conjunction on the left, right, for the comma, separating gamma, which one is it? It's, t it's the times. It's the same on the right. I've got two different disjunctions because, of course, it's possible to do these two rules when I make or when I use, did I say right and left? I confused it down here. This is left, sorry. So when I'm using a disjunction, there's two ways to do it. I either share my resources or I don't. And so when I've got a comma on the left, that's not a plus, that's a par. Sorry, a comma on the right, that's not a plus, that's a par. The disjunction in the turnstile judgment is the par. So that's kind of, you can 
the meaning of the par is what happens if I have more than one thing on the right hand side. That's what par is. It's not a possibility. Yeah. So this one and this one and this one. Yeah. So it matters. This one. Uh, well, this one is saying I've got two different proofs, both of which could conclude T1. And this one's saying I've got a single proof that concludes one of these things. This will be one derivation tree. This will be two derivation trees above the, the line. So in a tree, this is a binary node because there are two subtrees. This is a unary node. There is one subtree. So I mean, structurally, they're just completely different things. There's no relation to them whatsoever. Yep. Oh, sorry. OK. So uh, now what else is I going to do here? Mm. I think, so it's about 10.30. I think this is a fine time for a break. And I will continue on. No, no, right before the break, I want to talk also about the constants. And then we'll break. So this is short, which is these are all binary connectives, meaning I take two propositions and I combine them into one. So what are the nullary versions? We saw that before, where we had a binary product, which was a pair of two things. And then that sort of degenerate nullary case where it was just unit. And I had the combination of no things. Right? It was just a value with no interesting stuff inside. And the same for sum, there was also a void, which was I had two possibilities versus no possibilities. So what are the empty cases of these? So essentially, instead of saying, I have two things, I, right, I have an A and a B, what is the, the unit of that? Right? What is the unit of these things? And so each of these connectives has their own unit, right? a neutral kind of thing that if I have, so for example, you know, true intuitively and, and tau means this. So what are the neutral kinds of things for all of these, right? The nullary version. And so it's called top. And the formula is, well, what if I just have no things up here? So here, right, if I've got one, there are no premises where there were two premises. And here there were two possibilities, so there's just no possibilities. So here for top. The way that looks is this rule, I just have all of no things up here. So that looks like uh, gamma entails top delta. So that's top on the right. And there is no top on the left rules. And from an extremely just high level reading, what does this look like if I'm talking about proofs, which is if I need to prove that one of the things on the right are true, and this is just true, OK, it's true. right? No problem there. So top is one way of writing truth in sort of that normal intu intuitionistic logic sense. It was just true. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to say anymore. Right? So here's one of them. Top, top is the truth element corresponding to conjunction, or sorry, con corresponding to with conjunction. What about for this one? So again, the same thing, but everywhere I had two stuff, I will have no stuff. That's the idea. So there's a rule corresponding to here, where instead of saying this breaks down into two inputs I am given, it will break down into no inputs, because there's no things inside of the unit value. So. I will write for this one because that's the neutral element of multiplication. So that's at least a sensible thing to say. So what's one on the left? Up here, I had two things. I instead, if I look at a unit, I am given no things because that's what it's got in it. 
right? So that's the way you use one. If I'm given, if someone says, here you go, it's an empty box, fine, there's nothing in it. That's not very interesting. And then how do I make one of these things? Uh, so it's like this, again, except I have no premises. And also remember the environments were split, or rather, the environments from the premises were combined together in the conclusion. So if I've got no premises, I've got no other resources. So the rule for proving or for making one of these one unit types is this. So I'll say this is one on the right, which is if I am given nothing, then I can just make exactly one of those things. But I can't have any other stuff lying around. Right? And so this one is one. One. Okay. So that's the trick of doing uh, what are the unary versions of things. And it's a useful exercise to see if you understand what's going on. And what if I turn a binary thing into a, or not unary, but nullary thing. So let's finish it off for the disjunctions. So let's see. So what do we do here? All right, so I had two different ways of making one of these. And this is very much like the void type, because this is like the sum type in functional programming. Right, if I had two constructors for making them, what if instead I had no constructors? Right? So here it's, I have no, uh, I'll call it no because that's the neutral element of plus. No, zero on the right rules, because there are no values of this type. Right? That's the intuitive one. So then, what happens if someone gives me one of these? What does that mean? That's kind of a little odd, isn't it? Because no one could make one of these. So if someone says, I've promised to give you one, that's a little bit vacuous. It doesn't make sense. And so here, um, the way you write that is like this. So this is 0 on the right, which says, I've technically obligated my purpose, uh, assuming all of these things are true, to prove one of those, because 0 could never be true. And I derived this rule because I took this one and I made the premises empty. And then that's just what you've got, right? So I had some gamma and delta, which were shared among all premises, of which there aren't any. And so I'll say that is an axiom. If I try to prove something that assumed falsity, that is just vacuously true. OK, but then what about over here? Yeah? Thank you. That should be OL. Yes. I'm mixing up my lefts and rights. Um, yeah. So then what about here? So here, the right rule, what that one's doing is splitting up a part into two things. And so this is going to be a lot like the unit here, because they were kind of modeled after each other, or sorry, the times here, and the unit for the times, which is I split it up into no things, All right? So if I need to prove that gamma and the symbol here will be bottom, delta is true, then I can prove that gamma delta is true. And so this is the bottom right rule. And does that make sense? So this is false. Top was true. This is false. So if I have to prove this, is there any way I could prove false? There's no real way I could prove false, I hope. But that's the idea. So uh, we'll just throw it out, because that's clearly not a conclusion I could ever really justify. right? And so that's the idea here. Throw out impossible bottom results. Okay. Whereas here, uh, the empty version of this is I have no premises, so therefore I have no environments. Right? I was combining the environments from the premises. If I don't have anything to begin with, I still don't have anything. So the rule looks like bottom entails empty. So that's the left rule. Right, which is, if I assume that false is true, what can I prove? Well, kind of technically anything. And so intuitively, because uh, the, the uh, right-hand side of 
return style was a disjunction. What's the empty, or what's the disjunction of zero things? Right, what's the neutral element? That's truth, which is to say, I need to prove that one of the no things is true. Fine. There are no things, right? So that's just vacuous. So all of the nullary things are kind of weirdly vacuous and maybe a little bit confusing, uh, but they're at least useful to think about what they would be. Um, and they're definitely useful to state things because normally they're pretty boring. They're just boring constants, but they have an interesting story to say with resource use. So look here for top, just this boring unit value. This is one where somehow I'm allowed to produce a unit value no matter what resources I have, which seems maybe a bit odd. That one probably makes more sense, which is I need not the unit value, therefore give me nothing because I don't want to waste stuff. All right? That makes more sense. And why is there a difference? Well, because here I've got a way to use a unit. It's a boring way to use a unit, but I can, in a sense, use it, and I get nothing back. But here, there's no way you could ever really use a top value. That's not possible. So it's fine if you have stuff, because no one will ever talk to you, because you're terribly dull. Right? That's kind of the idea. It doesn't matter what resources you have, because you're just a hypothetical thing. Right? Um, and it's kind of the same here. Yeah? Yeah, you made a plan for making unit. You the and exactly. And then someone says, your business produces nothing and you get no funding. Right? That's exactly what it is. Right? It doesn't matter what your, your payment schedule was because uh, your business is completely stupid. And therefore, you get no funding, and so that's fine. Whereas here, yeah, fine, I will fund your business for doing nothing because you ask for no resources. OK, fine. Right? That's <laughs> technically, that, that I'm fine with that, but it's not you know, very, very informative. And so that's kind of the difference, right? If you do nothing, are you really doing nothing, in which case you absolutely can't get access to resources because you would be wasting them? Or are you hypothetically doing nothing and everyone ignores you? That's, that's the difference. And then these, as before, are mirror images of sort of the, the, the uh, falsity, right? So sort of vacuous, this one, um, is the real proof of false. And this is somehow my plan for my amazing theorem where I assume that 1 is equal to 0. And everyone just, just, no one cares. That's boring, right? Um, that's the kind of thing it is, yeah. And so finishing off, of course, that was zero, pronounced zero, so the numbers are easy, and uh, bottom. Bottom, so just like with conjunction and disjunction, there's two notions of truth and false in linear logic, and they differ on resource use. So it's this kind of magical duplication that once you care about how much you use something, suddenly you've got two of everything which is a little bit odd, but that's how it goes. Um, OK, so I think now we'll take a short break, or I guess after this question, and then uh, we'll come back and continue. Yeah? Is propositional logic a response to Boolean algebra? What does Boolean logic respond to? A bunch of stuff. And they're all very complicated. <laughs> but yeah, so, so there's, there's like a bunch of semantics for linear logic, and they're very odd. Like one of them has to do with geometry, and another one is with some other stuff. Uh, so, so I think, I think the, the, the story I, I read in one of Sherrard's papers was like, at least his, his, his inspiration on that linear logic works and makes sense, like where he kind of derived it from, because logicians had been playing around for a while of what if we don't have structural rules and nothing really interesting happened. But he started with a semantics for system F because he's also the guy who invented system F. So basically, he revolutionized programming languages and then did it again before we like, knew even what he was talking about. But um, so, so he was looking at the semantics. And the meaning of implication of functions was really, really complicated and annoying. And he's like, and he thought, why is that really complicated and annoying? So he, he, he uh, decomposed that into simpler pieces and then ended up with linear logic was the idea. So like decompose and then sort of generalize. And once you could do that, you can make everything nice and symmetric. Uh, so that's kind of where that came from. But yeah. All right, so we'll be back in, let's say, oh, 15 minutes and then continue. <laughs>